Amen. So uh, we're going to be just going into the next section in John, which is John 12, still John 12, um, verses 20 through to 43. And now this is a, a very large passage. I'm not going to read it all at the beginning, okay? So I'm just going to give a summary, and then we start sort of working our way through it. So um, this is like a, an outline of the passage. Number one, the Greeks begin seeking Jesus, okay? Then Jesus starts speaking about the hour of his glorification. He then gives a, a message about a grain of wheat and the cost of discipleship. Jesus then shares his own inner conflict and the need to submit to God's will for what's going to happen to him. He talks about the judgment that's going to come over the world and the defeat of evil. The crowd, naturally, misunderstands what he says. And then John says this is to fulfill the prophecies in Isaiah. And then we hear about how the nation is fearing the authorities, is in fear of the authorities. There's also in this passage an emphasis on a certain title that Jesus is using for himself, the Son of Man. And I will just go into why that's important as well, just to help bring context, okay? So let's begin. If you can follow along with me, then please do. Um, so verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew, and Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Okay, so when you, sort of, you don't understand the context, it's a very strange way for Jesus to reply to the request. He doesn't say, yes, of course, I'll come and see these Greeks. He says, now's the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. And the passage begins with some non-Jews, in this case, we're told they're Greek, uh, coming to Philip, uh, who also has a Greek name, you know, so um, to seek an audience with Jesus. Now, at this time in history, I think it's most of you are probably aware, there's people who are Jews, ethnic you know, because that's their ethnicity. There's also people who've converted to Judaism, so they've had undergone circumcision, and they've decided to be counted among the Jewish people. And there's also God-fearing Gentiles, so that's people who worship the God of Israel, but have avoided getting circumcised and getting too involved. And so Cornelius in the book of Acts is a perfect example of that sort of third category. And so it's probably that these Greeks are that third category. You know, they're just, they're Greeks who are worshipping the God of Israel and they've arrived for the time of the Passover and they've heard rumours about this messianic figure who's going around performing healings and exorcisms and they want to see this guy. They want to know what this guy is all about. So they find Philip, who obviously has a Greek name already, so that's helpful, and they say, we want to see your leader. Okay. Sir, we want to see Jesus. And Philip goes to tell Jesus, and Jesus just looks at Philip, and he's like, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Yeah? So that's probably, that reaction is going to be lost on most of us. And I just want to explain something here, that we think of the title, the Son of God, as being a very divine title. You know, because we think God the Son, okay? But within sort of the more ancient context, if you look at like Psalm 2, which is a royal psalm, it's said at the coronation of the king. So when the king is come in, the high priest anoints him with oil, and he says over him, um, you are my son today, I have become your father. The anointed one, the Messiah, the son of David is the son of God, because God has uh, anointed him and made him king. Which is why in, for example, John 11, Martha says, I believe you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. 
So if the Son of God had that sort of, sort of, this is about the royal figure of David, then the Son of Man, which we take to be a human title, is actually more divine. Okay? It's rooted in Daniel 7. So Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Daniel has this vision, and he sees heaven open before him, and he says this, In the vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming on the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days. He was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples from every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Okay, so Daniel has this vision of the Son of Man. And he's a figure who is in heaven. He's riding on the clouds. You know, these are something that God did in that sense. And he's given all authority, all power. And we're told all of the nations, people from every language and tongue, are going to bow down and worship before him. And he's given this everlasting kingdom that will last throughout the ages. Yeah? There's another Jewish book uh, from this period called First Enoch. And Jude in the New Testament quotes it, so we know the disciples of Jesus are aware of it. And in chapter 48, verses 2 to 5, it says this. At that hour, the Son of Man was named in the presence of the Lord of Spirits, and his name before the Ancient of Days, yeah, before the sun and the signs were created, before the stars of the heaven were made, his name was named before the Lord of Spirits. He should be a staff to the righteous, whereupon to stay themselves and not fall. He shall be the light of the Gentiles, and a hope of those who are troubled of heart." All who dwell on earth shall fall down and worship before him and will praise and bless and celebrate the song, the Lord of Spirits. So here we have another visionary experience from the same time period where the visionary sees the Son of Man standing before the Ancient of Days and we're told he will be a light to the Gentiles and a hope of those who are troubled of heart. All who dwell on the earth will fall down and worship before him. And we see these two titles, how they are perceived in Jesus' trial when we look at Mark's gospel. So Mark 14, verses 61 um, to 63. Jesus is on trial and the high priest directly asks him, he says, Are you the Messiah? the Son of the Blessed One. He's saying, are you the Son of God, the Messiah? Yeah? Jesus replies, verse 62, I am, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One, coming in the clouds of heaven. And the high priest responds to this by tearing his clothes and then crying, blasphemy. Okay, so Jesus affirms I am the Son of God, the Messiah. But what gets called out of blasphemy by the high priest is him claiming to be the Son of Man who is seated at the right hand of God. It's interesting, isn't it? So when Jesus, when the Greeks arrive and they come to him, and these are people from the nations, and they come and say, we want to see Jesus. Jesus says, now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified, yeah? He's seeing it as a sign. In the the time of Jesus, there was also a big controversy going on within Judaism. Um, There had been another visionary, a a rabbi called Elisha ben Abuya, and he had seen a vision of heaven where he had seen the the highest angel, who is called Metatron. Um, That's not Megatron for the Transformers fans out there. (laughs) Um, seated in heaven next to God, next to the Father. And because of this, he said, perhaps there are two gods or two powers in heaven. And it was declared to be a blasphemy that must never be spoken within Judaism. And yet here we've got Jesus standing before the high priest and he says, the Son of Man, 
who's me, is going to be seated next to the Father in heaven, and you're going to witness this. So no wonder the high priest is like blasphemy and starts tearing his clothes. Do you know what I mean? He gets exactly what Jesus is claiming, okay? So if we go back to the, the scripture, Jesus sees the Gentiles coming. He sees the Greeks coming, and he's like, now is my hour. Now is my hour. It's coming. After all, the Son of Man is going to be the light of the Gentiles. And it's, we live in sort of like, this is way history now, isn't it? It's like a long time ago. And so we're not living with the same sort of expectation that prophecy is going to be fulfilled as the people who are living there. You know, they're looking for the Son of Man who's going to be given this everlasting kingdom that's going to rule over all of the nations. And another one of those scriptures is Malachi 1.11, where God says, My name will be great among the nations, from where the sun rises to where it sets. In every place, incense and a pure offering will be brought to me, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. So when these Greeks arrive and they're coming up to the temple, they're coming to see Jesus, there's this expectation that all of these prophecies are going to be fulfilled. Jesus is like, yes, the nations are coming. They're asking after me. This is the beginning of the end. Because soon, in every nation, from the east to the west, incense and pure offerings are going to be offered up to the Father. So Jesus continues here in 24, verse 24. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. So this is Jesus wanting to point out about his death. You know, that a seed just remains a seed. But if it dies, if it goes into the ground, it becomes a tree or a fruit or a plant or whatever that has many seeds. It produces much life, but it has to be die. It has to die first. It has to be planted. And just as Jesus' death leads to new life, we're called to follow him in that way of death, to die to ourselves. So this is another question we've been looking at today about the kingdom coming. So what ways in our own life are we hindering the revelation of the kingdom being visible in our community? Perhaps we're holding on to things that aren't helpful in our own lives. Maybe that's personal ambition. It might be some sort of comfort that we're holding on to, which is inappropriate, or some form of sin. Perhaps we're failing to bear fruit because we're holding on tightly to the wrong things, whatever they might be. In verse 25 to 29, we read this. Jesus says, Anyone who loves their life will lose it. But anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. And where I am, my servant also will be. My father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, no. It was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then there was a voice from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there heard it and said that it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. So in these verses, Jesus um, informs us what it is, the cost of following him. The demand to follow him even into suffering, even into death. And he's facing that own reality of the cross because he knows it's going to happen. He knows that he must soon face the hour. Yeah, it's coming. And so he's wrestling here with his own internal emotions, his eternal his internal feelings. It's the paralleled with the Garden of Gethsemane that we find in the other Gospels. And the crowd hears a voice from heaven affirming that God's name has been glorified and it will be glorified through his death. Now, each of us 
in life. I don't know what everyone's going through right now, um, but each of us can feel that sort of emotional turmoil in our own lives, can't we? But Jesus says, now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. And that's the reality, isn't it, of living in this world, that we go through times of great difficulty, times of great trial. And yet, Jesus promises, my Father will honor the one who serves me. Yeah? That's good. That's something we've got to to hope for, you know, that if we're honoring the Son, then the Father will honor us. Yeah? Yeah? Perhaps your heart cry today is like that. Father, save me from this hour. The fact is, like Moses experienced God in the darkness. Elijah found God in a still, small voice. And Jesus promises, my Father will honor the one who serves me. God's purposes are never, you know, gone off off track because of suffering or because of death or difficulty. Rather, those things are usually the way into God's purposes. That's the message of the cross, that we take up our own cross and live that life forward towards God. And that means that sometimes we have to face very difficult decisions, whether at work, in our personal relationships, in our personal lives, to choose integrity and to choose godliness, even if the cost is high. And that means standing up for justice or for forgiving someone, even if you really don't want to forgive them. Yeah? Because God in Christ first forgave you. It means making tough ethical decisions in our own lives. And this is often difficult. It comes with a social cost. And yet Jesus promises that my Father will honor the one who serves me. Yeah? That goes for me, and it also goes for you. In the next section of today's passage, Jesus turns to the, the cosmic significance of the events at hand. Okay, so he says this. So verse 31, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. And the crowd spoke up. We've heard from the law that the Messiah will remain forever. So how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus told them, you're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you might become children of light. And when he had finished speaking, Jesus left and he hid himself from them. I mean, I always find those sort of passages slightly amusing that Jesus, you know, he hid himself from them. You know, is he playing hide and seek or whatever else? You know, I'm sure he wasn't. Um, It's just my silly mind. But it's just the way, you know, that Jesus removes himself from the immediate environment so that they can now ponder and think upon and dwell on what he has just said. Notice the crowd's question. Who is this son of man? Okay, so that's a good question that they've had. We've been exploring that today already. And Jesus says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And he's referring to Satan and all of the forces of evil who are going to be overthrown by his death and resurrection. Paul writes it this way in Colossians chapter 2, Verse 15, he says this, Having disarmed the powers and the authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So the cross, although it looks, has the appearance of a defeat, is actually a victory. It's a triumphing over his enemies, 
over the powers in the unseen world. Yeah? Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 15 puts it this way. Since the children, that's all of us, have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and flee, free sorry, those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So... By becoming man, he sets us free from the power of death. Yeah, By dying, he overcomes death. I like to think about it this way. All of us, all of us, have a deep-seated death anxiety. We fear death. And the fear of death often finds its way into Lots of different avenues of life. You know? the, it's one of the reasons why we do crave money or sex or power. Because we want to make a name for ourselves. We want a legacy that's going to last forever. We want children who are going to inherit our genes. We want all these things so that we might live on somewhere after we've died. Yeah? We want to accumulate all that we can, make a great name for ourselves. We want to be remembered. We have that fear that after we're gone, no one will remember us. Yeah. So this death anxiety enslaves us to the things of this world. Yeah. And Hebrews talks about it this way. Those who all of their lives were held in slavery by a fear of death. But Jesus, by freely dying, freely choosing death, and then rising again on the other side, changes the use of death. If death is no longer the end, then I don't need to store up all this wealth. I don't need to get all the power I can in this present age. I don't need to accumulate everything in this life. Rather, I can choose to freely give it away. Because death isn't the end. Yeah, actually, there's something better on the other side. And death is no longer that which enslaves me to this present life. Rather, it is the way to freedom. Yeah. I no longer have to satisfy my own lust, but rather I can sacrifice for love. I no longer have to define my position according to power, but because power will fade away. The things of this life are temporary, rather than the things that are eternal. And this liberation from death, it allows us to love and to have selfless love for others, in contrast to a bondage to sin or to materialism. And since we're united in Christ in our baptism, we share in his death, in his resurrection, that that new life now lives in us. Yeah, we've got this new identity. We're now the children of God. Yeah? We enact our deaths in baptism so that we might be free from its grasp over our lives. So that we now follow the risen, crucified one who lives with death now behind him. Jesus' statement is that he's going to be lifted up. And it recalls both um, the earlier prediction of his type of death, that he's going to suffer on a cross, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man is going to be lifted up. Yeah. Um, but also his exaltation, his glorification. He's going to be enthroned at God's right hand. Yeah. He's going to be lifted up, both in suffering and in triumph, both in death and in the resurrection. In verses 35 to 36, Jesus says, You are going to have the light just a little while longer. And while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you, walk, sorry, while you have the light, before darkness overtakes you, whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light whilst you have the light, so that you may become children of light. 
So throughout John's gospel, we've got these, these themes of light and darkness. And Jesus is the light of the world. And so when we reject him, it means walking in darkness because he's the light to the Gentiles, yeah? It means we must hear his call to believe in the light whilst we have the light. Whilst we have the opportunity to believe, let us make the choice to believe, yeah? So even today, if you're in two minds, whilst you have an opportunity to believe, choose to believe that you might not walk in darkness, but rather walk in the light. The last section of today's passage in 37 to 43 focuses on why a large part of the Judean nation is going to reject Jesus and his ministry. And John sees this as a fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecies. Isaiah had spoken of the nation's hardness of hearts, that they've got ears, but yet they do not hear. Yeah? And so he's trying to explain why the Judean people in full do not believe in Jesus despite his many clear signs and the testimonies about him. Jesus, like many of the prophets before him, was rejected by the people that he called to preach to. At the beginning of the passage that we came to today, we have the Greeks coming wanting to see Jesus. And yet we end the passage with the Judean people having rejected him. Yeah? So it's the nations who are coming towards him whilst his own people are moving away. The Jerusalem temple will be destroyed. And yet Malachi says, soon in every nation, incense and a pure offering is going to be offered up to God from the sunrise to the sun set. Yeah? The temple will be destroyed. But the true temple, the body of the Messiah, will spread everywhere. We read in verses 42 to 43. At the same time, even many among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear. But they would be put out of the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. I mean, it's not a nice thing to write about anyone, is it? Yeah? They loved human praise more than praise from God. Now, we don't know everyone's hearts, and we don't know the hearts of all of those who followed, but we know John's opinion here, and John has an opinion. Um, but that, may that never be said of us, that we valued human praise more than the praise of God. Many of you might not be aware, but my work has been very challenging over the last few months. Um, National newspapers have covered the gross misconduct and deep-rooted tensions within the Christian charity where I work. The former CEO was accused of using charity funds for his personal expenses and transferring funds to his personal accounts. Senior leaders have been suspended And, yeah, it's a mess. It's a mess in general. And yet, throughout the past six months or so, I've had to make very difficult choices, even this week, of how I'm going to react in the situations that they present themselves. Yeah? And all of us face these sort of challenges in our lives regularly. Yeah? It's part of living in the world. Do we choose to live wanting God's approval or the approval of man? Will we hide things away? Will we try and, you know, put a facade over things, you know, put sticky tape over things? Or are we going to tell the truth so that light might be a disinfectant over things? Yeah? We live with choices. Do we obey humans or God? 
there is a quote that I've always found very helpful, and it's, all humans are prone to error, and all leaders are human. Christians error, they do. I know I get things wrong many times. Yeah, They let you down, they break your trust. And yet, we choose how to live and how to react when those sort of situations arise. So I just want to circle back around today. In conclusion, this passage, Jesus reveals that his impending death is going to bring both judgment but also salvation. Yeah, He's drawing all people to himself. He's defeating evil. And he calls people to embrace a life of self-sacrifice, to prioritize God's favor over human favor. Yeah? And through the metaphor of a seed that needs to die, yeah, he underscores the transformative power of sacrifice in our own lives. Though the cross doesn't become the end, but rather a means of transformation in our lives to the other side. And his words and his actions, he's fulfilling those ancient promises, the hope of Israel, that through the suffering and the resurrection of the Messiah, all of the nations of the earth will be blessed and they will come and worship and bow down before the Lord of Spirits, before the Ancient of Days. Amen.